Okay, thank you very much. Let me start by thanking the organisers uh, for this invitation. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. Um, what I want to cover um, is um, I want to talk to you broadly about systems thinking for dealing with wicked problems. So I'll start by simply um, introducing the idea of wicked problems, which are basically highly complex and intractable problems. The kind of things um, we think about, like climate change, um, biosecurity, these sorts of issues. And then I'll also talk about what is systems thinking. Um, it's used to address a wide range of issues, and not just wicked problems, but it is wicked problems I'm particularly interested in. The other thing I should mention about systems thinking is we're talking about a hundred years of research on everything from physics and biology uh, through to management and family therapy um, and it's not going to be possible to do anything but touch on a, a fraction of that kind of work. Um, so I'm going to focus on approaches for policy and management in particular that are relevant to uh, large scale wicked problems. Um, I'm going to talk about different systems approaches for different purposes and I'm going to give some practical examples and those practical examples come from uh, my own work uh, on in action research in both the UK and New Zealand. As um, In New Zealand I worked for seven years in a government research institute so some of these are uh, sort of high level government research projects. And I'll end with three systemic principles for addressing wicked problems. So let's start with what are wicked problems. Well, the term was first coined by Brittle and Weber in 1973. It's a term that's still widely used in policy circles, and um, with the global interconnected issues we're facing, uh, it's having quite a resurgence. So I use the term wicked problems because it has that policy connect. Um, and I won't go into great detail, but just pick out some of the phrases on the slide that you'll see above there. So many interlinked issues, cutting across silos, um, high degree of complexity, maybe multiple agencies uh, across public, private and voluntary sector accounting for multiple scales, many different viewpoints and conflict, uh, power relations making change difficult, and uncertainty about possible effects of action. So you're talking about the really, really difficult problems, problems that we might say are more messes than problems. The kinds of problems where there's no optimal solution, just a, you have to find some kind of way forward. So if that's the kind of issue that we're dealing with, um, we need to ask, what is systems thinking? And I'm going to break that term systems thinking down into the two words, and I'll start with thinking. Now a lot of thinking um, is framed in language, language is socially shared, um, so actually it's dialogue that helps us think. So this is not a naive notion of thinking that is something that just goes on in people's heads, it's about what goes on in people's heads and dialogue with others, and in a context of action. And then we can go on to the notion of system. And given that huge variety of systems ideas I mentioned, a hundred years of uh, research, where there are literally hundreds of different methodologies, many, many different systems ideas, I have to ask how we can make sense of that kind of field. Now, in 2008, I came across a paper by one of our other speakers here, Derek Brer and colleagues, um, and he talked about four systems thinking skills. And when I saw this um, paper, I realized that it, it did something quite neat. Um, although it, it, it brought, broke systems thinking down to its bare essentials, you could also see that all the various methodologies that are used um, for uh, action research in the systems field actually tend to prioritize one of these systems thinking skills over the others. Um, they all incorporate all the skills, but they tend to prioritize one, and in that way, you can begin to see um, some patterns across the field of systems thinking, and begin to use these different approaches in a complementary way. 
So the four skills, now I've played with the, the, the uh, Cabrera's language a bit here, I've, I've, I've changed things a little. Um, but the four skills um, are thinking in terms of boundaries, um, what's included or excluded or marginalised for that matter, not necessarily fully included or excluded. Thinking in terms of relationships, how are things connected, uh, what are the causal pathways, the virtuous cycles or vicious cycles that we're dealing with. Um, the system notion itself, the idea that a system is a collection of parts that are organised in a particular way to give rise to, uh, to phenomena or meaning that you wouldn't predict from any one of those parts in isolation, but can only be seen in relation to the whole. And systems are often nested uh, within each other as well. So, uh, my liver is a system and it's nested in my whole body uh, as a system. And the fourth one is thinking in terms of perspectives. So, different perspectives on what the system is. So, um, for example, the brain is a highly complex uh, neurological system to a neuroscientist, but to a butcher it's just a piece of meat. <laughs> so, you can see that from different points of view the system will look quite different. And as I said, I, 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 I worked out that um, you can look at these systems thinking skills and begin to align the different approaches, systems approaches to them. And let me emphasize, as I start this, um, that all these systems approaches I'm going to talk about are about intervention. They're uh, about research to actually bring about change. It's a form of action research. Um, while traditional science seems as to see itself mostly as prioritizing observation and avoiding intervention that might corrupt the observation, systems thinkers tend to value observational science, but say it's just one useful approach for, uh, to stimulate change. So these are about methods for intervention. So in terms of exploring boundaries, um, we have approaches for exploring boundary judgments, and, and value judgments that are linked to them about what should be included or in or excluded from analyses. Um, we have approaches for understanding complex causality and feedback, vicious and virtuous circles, and through that kind of modeling you can explore the consequences of intervention. We have approaches for developing viable and highly responsive uh, organizations at multiple scales. So theoretically, scales going right from the global to the local. Um, and we have approaches for addressing conflict and exploring multiple perspectives um, and agreeing solutions that people are willing to implement. So when you have multiple perspectives and it's very messy, um, you might not be able to get a consensus, but you can often find ways forward uh, using the systems approach. So let me start. I'm going to go through these fairly rapidly with examples. I'm going to start by talking about approaches for exploring value and boundary judgments. Now this diagram represents perhaps the fundamental theoretical idea behind uh, systems approaches that talk about exploring boundaries. So this here is a boundary that represents the inclusion of stakeholders and the inclusion of the issues that matter to them. And it also defines what's excluded as well. This peak here represents the values, um, and values tend to um, drive the setting of boundaries. So, actually, by exploring people's value judgments, you can begin to get a better sense of how to draw the boundaries on a project. Um, it's also the case, though, that we come into a world, we're not autonomous people who can just take any value we like, we come into a world of institutions that already um, have boundaries um, instantiated within them, and those limit the possible values it's possible to explore and express. So there's this tight relationship between boundaries and values. Now, what I find is when I'm working with stakeholders in projects, um, if you start with back talking about boundaries, people interpret it as constraints, and that's not very helpful. So I tend to start by talking in terms of values 
which actually opens up the possibility for different boundaries. Now, there's a lot of theory here that I can't cover. It's, there's theory about conflict processes when people make different value judgments and different boundary judgments. There's theory about marginalization processes in social systems um, where stakeholders and issues that concern them are marginalized and derogated, uh, demonized sometimes. Um, I won't go into all that, but I will give you a little example from a project of how you might deal um, with issues of marginalization. So this is a project um, I undertook in Manchester in the UK. I was commissioned by three voluntary organizations to work with a wide range of agencies, voluntary and statutory, um, to help them develop services for young people under 16 living on the street. So in Manchester, um, there are roughly 2,000 uh, children a year living on the street for either a few days or months at a time. It's a problem that until I started this project, I didn't even know existed in Manchester. It's kind of the sort of problem you associate with Brazil rather than uh, a developed economy, but there it is. Um, so we would wanted to develop services and we wanted to do this with the young people's views firmly in the center of uh, what those designs were going to be. So we had to deal with two ways in which young people were marginalized. So as young people under 16, um, young, they tend to be viewed as less rational, less able to make informed decisions than the, about their own lives. And also because they're living on the streets, they tend to be regarded as troubled teenagers. So they, um, in order to survive for more than a few days, kids will have to get involved in things like prostitution or, or uh, drugs trade or, or possibly uh, mugging other kids. So these are uh, uh, children who could be um, labeled as very difficult. So it's, how do you actually deal with that marginalization and get people, get these young people central in the design of the services? How do you avoid professional boundaries and values dominating that design? So the first thing we did was we sought the views of young people before we involved the professionals. So we went out on the streets at night and we interviewed young people. Um, we communicated their words and not just ours to professionals. Um, and that is about conveying the emotional experience of being on the streets. And that is really important because this is a problem that um, none of the agencies have a statutory responsibility to address. So it's about how do you actually harness people's willingness to create change and that emotional experience of, of seeing young people's words is, is vitally important. And we also use the same kinds of design methods with young people as with professionals. And at this, when we actually decided to do that, we had a bit of a disagreement there where some people wanted to use playful theatre methods with young people and other people wanted to use more formal design methods. We went with the design methods in the end because it meant that the young people were treated exactly the same way as the professionals, and you could actually compare what the young people said and what the professionals said. And you actually found through that that what the young people asked for was quite reasonable, and the agencies were quite able to deliver it. So that's just one little example. So let's move on to approaches for understanding complex causality. Now I'm going to show you what superficially just looks like a plate of spaghetti. But I'll, um, and I won't explain the detail of this, but I'll explain what it is. So this is a causal loop diagram. It comes from, um, from a methodology called system uh, dynamics. You can produce these models quantitatively, or you can produce them qualitatively. This is a, quality, a qualitative model. So it comes from a project I did in New Zealand um, on the transmission of Campylobacter, which is a bacteria that causes food, it's food poisoning bacteria, um, from animals to humans. So the big concern in New Zealand was that dairy farming was growing uh, exponentially, and dairy cattle carry Campylobacter, and the bacteria were being transmitted from animals to humans. And New Zealand has the largest uh, level of compilobacter poisoning in the, in the developed world. So we were commissioned to do this project. 
It was also a highly conflictual pro uh, problem because the farmers' union just flatly refused to believe that the problem existed, and it had become front page headlines with science saying that this was a major problem, uh, scientists saying it's a major problem, and other stakeholders disagreeing. And we had to find some way to bring the stakeholders into a room together to even start a discussion because it had become so conflictual that people wouldn't even talk to each other. So the way we did this is to work with different stakeholders who had different understandings of the problem. So there's an area of the map up top here that deals with the human sewage system. Um, you don't need to know the details. Let's, let's take it from me, that's the case. This area deals with the human sewage system. This area here deals with, with the cows. There are various other bits and pieces in there that deals with things like campylobacterium ducts. Um, the point is that each stakeholder group was blaming the other. The, the farmers would say it's human sewage, the, the, the human sewage people would say it's the farmers, um, some people would say it's the ducks, people who like the ducks and didn't want them culled would say it's the farmers. Um, and what we did was, once we got those, those maps of causality from each stakeholder point of view, we brought them all together in a room. And we got them to look at what the causal connections were between elements in their own maps and elements in other people's maps. And we began to start to draw these various lines that connect the things together. And after a process of several hours, people began to come to the realization that you can't talk about their little bit of the system in isolation, that these things are all interconnected. And at the end of the day, people were actually talking reasonably to one another. Not that they had some fantastic consensus and would go off into the sunset and uh, be, be happy, but they were able to talk and so it was uh, a step forward. I should also mention that the water scientists we were working with actually said a byproduct of that project was that we actually mapped all the various variables, including quite a lot of variables that hadn't been quantified. And it provided a good agenda for scientists to work on for, for, for the next few years. So let's move on to the um, third approach. Um, now there's been a lot of research on thinking in terms of whole systems, including research on ecosystem dynamics, which I haven't got time to go into. I want to focus on um, organizational systems. So the approach I want to talk about is, comes from a, an author called Stafford Beer, and it's called the Viable System Model. Uh, the Viable System Model um, offers a way either to diagnose problems in an organization, or to help design an organization from scratch that doesn't currently exist. And it's a multi-scale model, so you can have organizations within organizations. I'll just walk you through it briefly. So, Imagine that that shape up there is the environment of an organization. All organizations have to respond to their environment. Within that environment, there are sections of the environment that the organization is going to target. So let's say it's a business organization. Those might be uh, the markets that it's identified with the product. Or let's say it's a policy organization. Those might be parts of the population it's trying to serve. Um, with services. So you need to have um, parts of the organization, which are called system one, so that's why the number one is in there, um, that uh, provide services uh, or provide some kind of uh, response to the environment. Because you're talking about multiple uh, responses, you need some kind of coordination mechanism. So for example, there's suddenly um, Let's say this is a health service and there's suddenly a, a, a large epidemic here, so the, this organization is dealing with lots of patients. You may need to move resources from here to here, for example. And that's a coordination fu uh, function. You need management, and that management needs to be able to audit um, the functions of, uh, of the actual service provider. That means uh, the, the notion of management in the viable system model is management by exception, which means you look at what the upper and lower limits you want to keep within are, and you only intervene when the organization is, is uh, transgressing those limits. It, it stops micromanagement of, of uh, organizations by, by managers. 
you also need foresight. So you need to be able to look um, at what's happening in the environment and uh, be able to anticipate uh, changes and you need to be able to look within your own organization at the capacity of the organization and its ability to respond to what you're identifying. And finally, you need strategy. So this is a very simplified version of the viable system model, but these are the five functions of organization that all organizations need in order to be viable. Um, you can build this at multiple scales. So uh, you take a university, you can see that a university as a whole needs all of these five functions. Um, within it, you may have faculties, and this whole structure can be reproduced in the faculties, and within those faculties, you might have departments, and the whole structure can be reproduced again. Um, so a typical example of a project using this that I, I've, got, I've done, I did a project on housing services for older people. So we were looking at how do you coordinate across agencies? Now that's a, a very wicked problem. Agencies tend to defend their own boundaries and not cooperate together very easily. So we were looking at health services, um, housing providers, and uh, um, welfare services. And we treated those agencies as the basic service providers and looked at how you design a multi-agency system around it to allow them to call them. So that's the kind of thing you can do. And the last approach is approaches for addressing conflicts and exploring multiple perspectives. And there's a huge number of methods uh, that have been developed for doing this. They're qualitative approaches that help people um, get better mutual understanding. And I've only got time to present one, so I'm going to present soft systems methodology, which is um, perhaps the widest known and widest applied. Um, it comes from an author called Peter Chetland. And as I go through this, I'll give you examples from my own practice. So he says, let's not assume that there's a system there to start with. It might just be a, a mess. So you have to map the mess. And mapping the mess means capturing information from stakeholders about the whole messy situation, including disagreements. So this is an example of a rich picture, the way to map the mess, uh, from a feasibility study for building a, a, a water storage dam to address drought in New Zealand uh, that I was involved in. You don't have to uh, understand that diagram. What matters is that the people who drew it understand that diagram and can use that to, to reflect back on. Um, as I said, it's a participative exercise, it combines everybody's understandings, and it also represents disagreements. And once you've done that, once you've got a basic idea of what the issues are, you need to be able to identify possible transformations that different people want. So where are we now, and where do you want to get to? And it's vital then to explore what those mean to different people. Um, the trick is not once you've actually got some basic understanding of the issues, the trick is not to force agreement on one transformation at that early stage, but to keep multiple possibilities on the table, because they can then be used as vehicles for people to learn about each other's perspectives. So the purpose of this phase is to work, uh, is to identify possible ways forward, so different possible transformations, and to build mutual understanding. And there's a nice little mnemonic that you can use um, to help build uh, mutual understanding. And that's this, I call it uh, back road. Um, so people tend to talk past one, uh, one another. They tend to use the same words to mean different things. Which is why sometimes you can get agreement in a workshop and then when go people go to implement the strategy, it all breaks down because they realize they didn't have a proper agreement after all. So you can actually trans, uh, explore different dimensions of the, the, uh, the issue. So you can look at the transformation, that's, that's right in the middle there. You can look at um, the beneficiaries, who's going to benefit from that change. The actors, who's going to carry that change out. Um, the worldview, what assumptions, what values underlie this. The owners, now the owners are not financial owners, they're anybody who can stop the transformation from happening. You need to take account of those owners. Possible victims, 
Um, who could be harmed by this and should you take that into account? And environmental constraints. So what do you have to take as given? Which might be the budget you've got or the laws that are in place or whatever. So once you've begun to have, get multiple options for change on the table and explore this enough to get mutual understanding, uh, you can actually start to map the activities that are needed to make that a reality. Um, I'm going to give you an example of an activity map. This one, you don't again need to look at detail, just look at its form. Um, it's a set of steps with some feedback loops as well. This comes from a project I did with the Ministry of Research, Science and Technology in New Zealand. So the, the government um, had commissioned four roadmaps for 30 year investment plans in biotechnology, uh, nanotechnology, energy research, and environment. And we were asked to evaluate not the content of those plans, but the process of, of giving rise to them. And what the, the reason we were commissioned to do this is that actually uh, had a hell of a lot of stakeholder conflict, especially with the environment plan. Um, and um, there, there was a lot of disagreement both from the science community and from stakeholders. And this is the map that we put together uh, that represents where they started from, the, uh, the activity model of what they actually did. And we worked with them on how that could change. And really they only made one significant change, which is this step in the middle, communicate early thinking with a wide range of stakeholders. They said that needs to happen a lot earlier. It needs to happen before the agenda of the roadmap is set, so that you do the stakeholder consultation and don't pre-frame everything too much. And they then um, implemented that in the next roadmap, which is the food roadmap, um, which, we followed, which we followed up a little, and certainly there was a lot more stakeholder satisfaction with that roadmap, because people were consulted much earlier in the process. So once you've done that um, kind of activity mapping, you can compare back to the earlier picture of the mess, and you can begin to look for accommodation. Now, I use the word accommodation quite advisedly. Accommodation doesn't mean consensus. It's very unlikely you're going to get a, a, a wonderful consensus amongst other stakeholders. You don't need that necessarily. Neither does it mean compromise. And compromise means that everybody feels like they've had to give up something. What you're looking for, ideally, is emergent accommodation. Ideas for ways forward that people weren't thinking about before they came into the room. Um, so an example from my own practice, I worked with um, a group of 19 organizations who were trying to design um, a counseling service that could be activated in the event of a major disaster. And they'd been tasked by the government to do this. Uh, they'd been meeting for 18 months and they had weekly evening meetings with a with a typical agenda, and they reached no agreement on how they were going to design this counselling service. So they came to us, and we worked with them in six days of workshops, um, and came out with quite a comprehensive plan, which was then implemented, and actually we did have a disaster in the region, and uh, it, it, it was a major train crash, and the counselling service actually worked well, and that's commented on in, uh, in the local papers. I use that, um, that uh, example for a particular reason. We um, tend to hear from managers that they resist participative approaches like this because they think they're going to be too time consuming. But in this case, we're talking about 18 months of discussion uh, reaching no conclusion. And we managed to get through this in six days. So my, uh, my uh, idea is that this is actually quite efficient and not just so I'm going to end now with um, some systemic principles. So I've talked about the four systems thinking skills and um, I've illustrated those with some typical systems approaches and methods. And those methods can boost our capacity to use those thinking skills. Um, so these three systemic principles, first of all, explore boundaries and stakeholders and issues um, and particularly processes of marginalization up front, and revisit those boundaries 
as new aspects of a problem present themselves. That's not always necessary if it's, a, if it's a simple problem, but in a wicked problem, it really is. And I've seen too many projects undertaken by consultants where they've just gone to a management group and taken their view of a wicked problem as given and then worked from there. And that can actually create um, unanticipated side effects and do more harm than good because no stakeholder um, has a whole understanding of the system. The whole definition of a wicked problem is that no, nobody does. So you have to start by with exploration. So the second principle is to draw upon and mix methods from across all those systems approaches, but also from the sciences as well. And it's the old adage that I'm sure we all have heard, if the only tool you have is a hammer, everything will look like a nail. So the more um, approaches that you can draw upon, the more flexible and responsive your systems practice will be. And the third uh, principle, and this is especially important if you've got limited experience in this area, is start from where you are. Um, try new methods when the need arises. So you're faced with an issue, maybe identify one thing that will make a difference and go and learn that. Nobody can be expected to learn six or eight methodologies from scratch before practicing. And the best way is simply to learn by doing. Um, now, it's one of my big bugbears that um, there are very few degrees in systems thinking. If you want to be an engineer or a doctor, you might spend three or six or eight years learning. And we're supposed to learn systems thinking from uh, an evening like this. It's a ludicrous thing. But it's the reality we're, we're, we're in. So without those degrees, learn from where you are. Take one step at a time. And I'll uh, hand over.